All right, hello everybody. Thank you for joining Apogee's Science of Data Product Management webcast. I'd just like to present the presenters. So my name's Alan Ho. This is Jin Zhang. I'm Jeff West. And we're part of the product management team at Apogee. So before we start, I just want to let you know about the I Love API conference. We actually have a promo code that you can use, webcast LMTD. And so for the first 10 people who register, they'll be able to get a pass for $195. It's a great conference. We'll be talking about APIs and we'll be talking about analytics. So the first thing I also want to let you know about some of our social channels as well. We'll be posting this webcast onto YouTube and then the slides will also be on SlideShare. And you know, let's talk a little bit about the agenda today. So we're gonna first talk about, give you some context, why we're actually doing this presentation. We're also gonna talk a little bit about examples of how Apogee does product management using data. Uh, and then last but not least, we're gonna provide some example decisions that we've made and summarize it. Jin, why don't you just kind of kick us off here? So why, what, what, what are you, why are we here? Um, yes. So let's first, you know, before we get into the data-driven product management, we first have to look around us and look around our world today. Uh, we are in the world where every field, especially product managers, are crazy about data. If you look at you know this little news clips I've put in here, it's all about how a company would leverage data and bring that to life to understand what is our customer doing, what is it that they like about our product, what is it that they need that we have not yet fulfilled. So this data really give us so much more to make our work to be able to be more effectively serving the customer and all that. Now you have to notice one thing that's really changing these days is the cloud around us. We pretty much live in the cloud um, wherever we go, right? Whether we're doing online shopping, we're reading, uh, we're looking up information, and cloud really has opened up that data access more than ever before. Previously, we don't always have these data. So in the product management team, we'd like to call ourselves product scientists or data scientists. In that sense, we'd love to be able to dig out the details, um, figure out you know, what this really means, and hopefully get some creativity out of it to say, oh, let's try a particular idea. So that's what we're here to talk about. Okay, cool. And uh, so we're not just, so product management, not just art? Absolutely, there's a lot of science to, in fact, Alan, I'm gonna ask you a question back. I know for a fact that in your experience, being a product manager, managing a lot of customer requirements from enterprises, you had to say no or yes in many cases. So talk to us about how you make those decisions and where you leverage data. Okay, sure. One of the things about building, we're Apogee's a software, enterprise software company. And kind of the, one of the biggest traps that you can get into is taking a customer's word uh, on face value, their, especially their requests. It kind of goes something like this. You know, you ask the customer uh, what's missing, right? They tell you, they tell you some requirement and the engineering team goes off implementing it. And then they don't use the product. They don't use that feature that was asked. And then so the team tries to figure out, oh, what are other things that we should do? So they ask the question again, what's missing? And this process is, uh, this death trap ends up, is one of the root, root causes of why like enterprise software in general become extremely bloated uh, and uh, not useful to customers because and probably you, very inefficient too. Exactly, yeah. very expensive, very inefficient, and hard to use. So, data actually serves two things. Data helps us figure out what products, features that we should develop or not develop, which features do not kill. But data actually that's, uh, lets us say no to customers with good reason. And I'm, when, what happens is that when we can actually take an insight to a customer and tell them no, it just not only uh, helps us kind of reduce our, it not only helps us as from customer satisfaction perspective, but it really also helps uh, the customer understand the different technology trends out there so that they themselves can make the right decisions. I think that makes sense to me. Um, if you tell me no, but give me an alternative, point me to different resources, I'll be willing to give that a try. So, you know, let's actually kind of go into an example. Can you show us a little example of like how we actually 
what do we actually really do? Absolutely. So on this next slide here, you will see I have put out an example, a simple example of how we look at feature adoption in our customer base. Um, for simplicity, I've only put out three customers, and you'll see I have their data for two months, the month of June, the month of July. It shows us the kind of the feature account they have using our product. I also have some traffic data, so I was able to plot them out on a dashboard. Now I put some rule behind the data where I say for a customer, if this current month they've made progress both from feature account perspective as far as as well as driving additional cloud traffic, I will give them a color of green. If they reversed or decreased, which is something we don't like to see because we love to see happy customers, then we'll give them a color of red. And in this case, you see, I do have a customer or actually two of them where there's some indicator that there may be some issues where we can help. And exactly what we would do is we would reach out to these customers to say, how can we help? We noticed something, um, you know, can we help you with some of your implementation? Uh, did our support respond to your request timely? Let us know how to help. So uh, just kind of looking at the graph again, you know, just because the traffic that is low, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad either, right? So can, you know, just thinking about it as well, like when we have a lot of customers that do more of the B2B kind of use case, their traffic might be low, but they're very high value. Let's say a telco is doing, uh, is activating a cell phone. Whereas just because it's high, it doesn't mean it's good either, right? We may have a customer that's using Apogee for their mobile traffic, where each transaction, API transaction might be low value. Yep. Um, but if they're not using the features, they're not using a lot of features, that kind of indicates to us uh, potentially they're not really getting value out of our product. Right? Or maybe our product for some reason wasn't intuitive enough for them, so we need to go there and learn about it. So absolutely true, the data is just a starting point. It triggers some action, some additional investigation, so we have to formulate that hypothesis mm -hmm. and then dig deeper into it. Okay, um, so next question is probably to Jeff. Uh, can you kind of give me some examples of when we actually used uh, data to make a decision? Absolutely. We recently built some connectors to allow people to connect to enterprise systems via APIs. And when we did this, we wanted to make sure that whatever we were building actually met a need. So what we did is we, did, we took an analysis of the connections that were being made outside of our platform. And we took the top ones, and we have some listed here. And then what we did was uh, figured out how we're going to build them and then engage with customers to say, is this useful to you? We're going to build these things. Is this what you would need? And I was like, yes, absolutely. So we took that validation, built them, and then engaged with them uh, when we brought the connectors to market so that they could then give us the final validation. Yes, this is what I need. Thank you for building it. So, so, so what, what, what actually happened when we launched the connectors? Uh so actually, so we saw a ton of downloads. Uh, I think you know, in the first you know week, we had you know three thousand downloads of our connector wow. modules from NPM. Um, so clearly, you know, our approach to you know figuring out what where the need was based on the data that we had uh, was validated, and we were able to feed that back into. We were able to collect the usage out there after that as well. Yes. So we can see also when people use the connectors on our platform. Yeah. Uh, we can see when they when they are using those as well, and we're pleased with the with the result. Okay, cool. So, how would you actually dive deeper into a customer, like like one particular customer? So, again, we are we're a product company. We want we have a product to sell. We don't want to lock people in. We want people to have a good experience with our product, right? That's what it, that's what the draw, job of a product manager is. So, in order to understand a customer's experience with Apogee we bring together several sources of information. So looking at their uh, support history, looking at their feature usage and their traffic history as well. And we have something that we use called 360, which has a dashboard for every customer that allows people in the company to see what their experience has been like. So can you, can you kind of go through this dashboard a little bit about like, um, what's the product issue? So why, why would that be red? So this is just an example. Luckily, we don't have many customers at the moment yeah. that are having product issues. So what we did was we tried to figure out, okay, well, what, what are the indicators that we have access to 
that would indicate whether a customer was having a positive, neutral, or negative experience with right. Apogee. So going from left to right here, product issues, are they having frequent support issues, mm -hmm. P1s and 2s, that are high priority issues where they're experiencing an outage yeah. with our product. If they're having a high frequency of those, then that would indicate that they're, they may not be having a good experience with Apogee. Okay. But on the flip side of that, you know, early on in a customer's adoption of our products, we, we do very much want them to open lower priority tickets. Correct. Because that indicates that they're using the product Correct. and have questions. Maybe Correct. we need to update the documentation. Maybe we need to make it more intuitive. Yeah. So that's another indication. We also look at the trend of traffic yeah. uh, and the breadth of features. So that so relates back to the first diagram where we saw the number exactly, of features. Exactly, yeah. How okay. many features they're actively using once they've purchased our product. So this is these KPI just kind of give you like a visual view and visual understanding of each individual customer. Yes. And uh, who, who looks at this other than just product management? So we have, uh, this is shared with the company. Uh, we, of course, treat the data sensitively. We don't share any, you know, business sensitive data this way. We only show summary data. So, and why would we share, share it with the whole company, right? We're in the business of making our customers successful and everybody at the company has a responsibility to make the customer successful. Okay. If they're about to have a conversation or a meeting with a the customer, they should know going into that what the relationship and what the experience has been like for that customer and then adjust their tone or their behavior for that meeting accordingly. Yeah. So if everything's great, um, you know, that's one path, but if everything isn't going well, say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I see that you've had a lot of support issues recently. How's yeah. that going, right? We need to hear the customer, we need to know what their experience has been like with Apogee in order to serve them uh, the best way we can. So I heard that you are the one who built a lot of this infrastructure. Can, can, you, uh, can you take us through a little bit about how, you've, uh, how, how we actually would build something like this? Absolutely. So we're an API company and we're very interested in data. All of this is built around APIs. We use APIs to get the data into the system and then we use APIs to share the data inside the company. So not only that, we're also using APIs to collect the data. Uh -huh. So we're using uh, Salesforce APIs, Marketo APIs, our own product APIs to get product information, our analytics APIs. We're, every source of data here comes from an API. Mm -hmm. So it's designed all around, uh, it's, a, it's an API based or focused data warehouse. Yeah. So uh, we have a few components we see here. We get things in and we use something called Piper, which is a message bus to route messages in order to do scoring of customers and have the indicators. We have a, what we call Weissman scoring. <laughs> uh, and then finally, nice. where did you get that from? <laughs> um, so if you, uh, in Nucleus, so if you're, if you're a fan of the HBO show Silicon Valley, you may see some references there. Yeah. Um, so you have to have fun at work. Yes, <laughs> I agree. And then finally, we put it into a Postgres database, which uh, has a really great feature set around JSON. Uh, so we can get the JSON from an API, store it in the database with some indexes, and then serve that up effectively. So we yeah. get the power of the relational database to do the analysis, yeah. but the flexibility of uh, a document type storage database to store the JSON as well. So, so why, why Python? Why Python? Um, the, the speed. Uh, yeah. You know, I did Java development for a very long time. Yeah. And I started, somebody gave me a Python script as a starting point for building this. And it's like, uh, I don't know. And so I iterated uh, and learned a lot about Python. And it's just really a pleasure to develop in Python. Yeah. Uh, it's easy to consume APIs. Uh, it's easy to, you know, pass data around and do analysis on the APIs. And you can do it fast without compiling it was just it was just a great experience so. yeah and you know actually because you know, i'm working on uh, our big data product uh, insights python after i find is actually the most popular language from a data preparation for data scientists so that a lot of data scientists use r for doing their and their hardcore yeah, analytics hardcore. and statistics mm -hmm. when it comes to like slicing and dicing data python is just just infinitely more flexible. And it runs on Hadoop. You can stream, you can do big map reduce jobs and, uh, and uh, slice, cut and slice and dice data on Hadoop. Yeah, it's just really fast to iterate, do iterative development. You don't have to deploy it, you just run it, change it. It's so, a lot of fun. So tell me a little bit more about the data. Like why, why is like API, getting data via API is important? So depending on how deep you are into the REST 
uh, specification and approach of doing data, right? Every, everything at a particular URI is a resource. And then what's being returned is a representation of that resource. Yeah. So working with JSON is very easy to do. Correct. Uh, and it's represented by a URI. Yeah. So one of the things that we wanted to do with Nucleus was not only build a system that housed and allowed us to analyze the data that we need as product management, mm -hmm. but also open it up with the company. Uh, and so we actually have a developer program. So like democratizing data, essentially. Very much. Okay. So get it in, have a place where people can, through an API, which everybody here knows, yeah. store the data and then get it out, the summary data. Yeah. So we build a system to do that. Mm -hmm. And so on the, on the slide here, you can see kind of what the payload is. So what yeah. we'll do is we'll make an API call, get the resource yeah. uh, get in the JSON format, and then package it in this envelope format. And what you can see here is it's versioned. Uh, the URI scheme has nucleus as the first prefix. Yeah. The name is ex escaping me. And then basically what we do is we have the first element of the URI path is the database schema where the thing is going to be stored. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, we pull out the data that needs to be indexed. We yeah. put it in the URI. And then we store it into the database with the JSON and those index values in a columnar format. And I see we're dogfooding our own stuff. The connectors you were just talking about, you know, we're yes. also dogfooding it too. Yes. Okay. So the way we use the connectors, we use the Postgres connector to surface the data out of the database yeah. uh, and share it with the company. And so, so this data is great for us. So how does it help our customers? Um, that's actually my favorite part. So if we go to the next slide, I actually have an example right here um, as far as how this data and this data-driven product management approach helps our customers. So in this particular example, we've mapped out uh, not only one particular client, but we picked a set of neighboring customers. Uh, right. And we have some criteria for that, right? Whether it's a particular geo, it's a particular type of industry, a vertical cut, um, whatever the criteria may be, the idea was to make sure there's similarity and reason to compare and reference, whether it's a similar use case, similar type of business model or market opportunity versus threat here. So when we look at this kind of a, a data-driven dashboard, I will be having conversations with customers such as, here's where you are. Now, if you look to your left, to your right, you'll see there is a group that's a lot more concentrated to your right, Yeah. right? And what does that mean, right? Are they concentrating on a set of feature and capability that's available to you today through our Apogee product, but you're for some reason not yet aware of? Can we could help be, you? Could be one of our earlier customers I mean, that, we, that didn't know about those features. Exactly, right? You know, can we share some of these use cases with you? Can we possibly help understand whether you had a particular requirement that you know that you didn't quite feel like this feature would allow you to meet that requirement, but yet we actually uh, you know are aware of some other tips and hints. Um, the other possibility here is to talk about, uh, for example, the other metrics we're measuring here on the on the traffic. Right, we see somebody way up there. Yeah. Um, and how did how is that comparable with your business, right? Yeah. Are you, as Alan, you described earlier, in a mobile space where you have a large number of subscribers? Um, yeah. Does this number surprise you, or does it align with your, you know, the trend, the record you've been tracking so far? So all these conversations are very exciting for our customers because they get to play detectives with us together. Okay. And once we connect the dots and we'll decide what to try, what to worry, and what to just simply ignore here. Yeah, so I would imagine like, for example, retail, the traffic would be really, would be very high because a lot of them are using mobile, whereas some like, uh, some other industries are more focused on B2B, maybe telco, they're much lower down in the stack. But what really matters is how are they doing compared to the industry? How relevant right? this is. Exactly, um, Alan, you're right. When we look at this kind of a plot from one vertical to another, we clearly see different patterns and yeah. different trends. And as Jeff talked about earlier on, we were trying to be very sensitive about you know what data we share, what data is only for internal, and what data we just completely mask out, right? Yeah. Just to make sure we're being very careful. But these kind of conversations usually will get our customers very excited. Very, very cool. So how, can you give me a little bit of an understanding, like how, how do we exactly share this data with our customers? So let me give you an example. Apogee is crazy about our customers. And 
by saying that, we reach out to our customers, and you know, it's not about once we sign a deal, buy, we're gone. You know, run it in our cloud. Um, good luck, right? So, there's many outreach to the customers in addition to the inbound ability to contact Apogee. And one example that I'm showing here on the slide is something we call a QCR, which stands for an Apogee Quarterly Customer Review. So we literally have a team, a customer success team, and these are our ninjas that they would reach out to the customers on a quarterly basis, say how you're doing. And it's not just about a courtesy call, it's yeah. not about just play kindness here. We actually have a set agenda to say what is the objective that you wish to have a dialogue with Apogee. Uh, how was your last quarter's experience using Apogee? What are some of the projects that's currently on your roadmap? A particular app you hope to build, a new marketing event you hope to drive out using our product, yeah. using leveraging the power of API and data here. Now, if you think about these, almost each one of these topics will give us a chance to insert data and have some very specific data-driven conversations. I know, I know, before I go to this QCR, I will go back to the 360 dashboard first and I'd see, like, if I see a lot of red dots for our KPIs, I'm like, okay, this is going to be a really hard conversation. Uh, and I actually prepare the data. I, I make sure I get the right data points before uh, that I'll present to the customer. But if it, everything's green and they're really happy, then I focus more on, hey, how can we better serve them and talk more about the new features that we have. And in, in the customer roadmaps, I would actually talk about those new features and sometimes actually present some data as well from an industry perspective. And that is so true, Alan, because the whole point of having these conversations, whether easy or difficult, is we want to be there with our customers, right? Yeah. We want to be very open and transparent, help us understand what was your journey and experience, and if there's any issues, we will help you. You know, we, we're in this together. Mm -hmm. So, so tell me, so th this is one of those places, the, our QCR is a place where you get both qualitative and quantitative feedback as well. So can you tell me a little bit more about like from a customer experience perspective, how do we actually do uh, measurements? We have a program at Apogee called ACE. And what that does is we use an NPS methodology yeah. that was put in place by one of our team members, Kelsey Vaughn, to regularly communicate with customers and have them take a survey to give us feedback uh, from their perspective about how we're doing and what their experience is like with us. Yeah. And as you know, one of the QCRs that, that you and I were both on, uh, we had a customer that was, uh, several of their indicators were red. And then, you know, we, we started asking, well, how's it going? And it's like, you know, it's like, oh man, it is going great. And we're like, um, really? <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's going great. It's going great. And, you know, gave us supporting evidence for that. And so I was like, okay, but we see your traffic going down. He's like, yeah, but we are doing integration and performance testing, so we expect that. Huh, so it's like, we really, it's kind of interesting thing for, especially enterprise companies, you can taper the qualitative feedback with the quantitative feedback, right? Yes. And, and make a much more insightful kind of decision on that. Absolutely, in order to have a complete view of a customer's experience with Apogee, you know, we only see part of the picture. Uh, and we need their feedback and their perspective to complete that picture. Hmm. Okay. So, you know, just this, just uh, thinking, just wrapping it up, like, can you kind of like, Jen, can you summarize kind of what we've, uh, what were uh, this, this, uh, the insights that we had from this presentation? Sure, sure. So let's summarize, uh, you know, a little bit about all the great things and the examples we've talked about so far. First and foremost, uh, we're here to talk to you about the joy we've had so far in product management field as we try to drive our decision from gut-based more to data-driven. Now that's simpler to say than actually doing it because we've learned this is really a continuous journey yeah. where we would gather the data, we would validate, formulate a hypothesis, we will validate it and based on the outcome, we may decide to put some improvements into our product. Yeah. And then we go through the circle again, right? But clearly, as some of the examples uh, both Jeff and Alan have given here so far, sometimes the data may not be the only thing that's telling. Yeah. You really have to combine that with additional source and additional validation to try to figure out what to worry about and what to simply ignore. And sometimes, certain data point that looks just to be there can be rather telling 
once you dig deeper into it. So just you know, continue to gather what's in your, in your tool bag and everything. Yeah. But the one last thing as our takeaway and for our customer and audience here, I really wanted to highlight is all these data detective work is super fun. Um, you know, the conversations are always great, great here, but you don't really see the real business value until you connect the dots. Mm -hmm. We so could look at insight, our right? plot all day long, but if our customer or us did not jointly figure out that one thing that's going to give us that breakthrough and move us to the next higher level, we have not really presented the business value. So we really think, you know, that's the piece we're most excited about. We, we all should come in together and figure out how to get that business value show up yeah. through data-driven product management. So, so just some, a couple of other questions then. Like, what makes an organization good at? Like, well, what, what fundamentally makes an organization like a team, what kind of environment would would help us get to this kind of uh, Nirvana vision of product management? I'm sure um, you know we all have our own perspective on this, but <laughs> I'll share mine. And Jeff, please feel free to chime in here. Um, I think one key thing is the organization really needs to have the mindset of value, data, value insights, and have that sense of curiosity. Yeah. Um, in many cases, in the examples I've shared here. It was a few levels deeper of digging yeah. beyond just the surface. And when you look at the surface, you may just walk by and decide not to do anything about it, right? So to me, that is really sort of a, a culture and gene kind of a mindset you, you really need to have there is to keep digging and wanted to find out what's underneath. Jeff, you want to add to that? Sure thing. So curiosity is a big part of it. Uh, I know, you know, going through and putting together the, the data sources and everything and, and making sense of it. So data curious. You right? have to be data curious. You have to, you have to wonder, okay, well, you know, what, what can I put beside this to make this more meaningful? Or I put these two things together, are they, you know, incongruent? Do they, do they have any dependency whatsoever? Do they even matter? Do I want to use this as a sensor for customer experience mm -hmm. or product adoption or something else? So uh, you very much have to balance the curiosity with and going and getting the data with what data do I need and what hypotheses do I have mm -hmm. and in many cases it's like okay let's get all that data and then let's see if we can make sense of it and then in other cases it's hey I think X or maybe X or how many of our customers are doing this and then you go and get that data so you have to have a mix of it right? if you have a team that wants to go out and get the, the product usage and multiple facets of your product but they don't have they don't know what question they want to answer, let them go and do it because I guarantee you they're going to answer more than one question they didn't know they had. Okay, last question. What's the verdict? Product management, art or science? Science. Both. Thank you. We have some extra time, so I'd like to ask questions. Does anybody have any kind of questions to uh, see the questions? Yes. Uh, we have a few of them. Uh, the first one is, how do you determine feature count? <laughs> this was a fun one. That was that was a fun one that we so, fight it that yes. we can we can never agree on. And we actually we actually decided to split it in half. There's kind of the there's the feature count and then there's feature areas. Some people wanted to track big buckets of features and other people wanted to track very, very small things and move the needle for those. Mm -hmm. So basically what we do is we look at the types of policies people are using. Each policy is not one feature. So if you're using OAuth 1, OAuth 2, SAML, and LDAP in the same po policy or proxy, um, that doesn't make sense. So, but it, what it does make sense is, you know, OAuth 1 and 2, hey, they're using OAuth. And then overall, they're using security. So that's where we get the feature category and feature area, and, that, and we balance that with our other products like Baz uh, and Insights and Analytics and our developer portal. Mm -hmm. So each of those is, if you're using the developer portal, we count that as one feature. But uh, in certain areas, we go deeper. And, and one uh, point I would add to Jeff's uh, great examples here is we also expect this definition to give us flexibility or evolve over time. What I mean by that is right now we may be only looking at bigger areas to make sure we don't miss the big picture. But then in some Absolutely. use cases, we want to drill in really deep to say specifically zoom in there, did customer prefer this or that? 
Was there some reason this one was used more than less? And these all give us incredible knowledge here. And I'm sure during product launch or a new, like a brand new feature launch, that that granularity we zoom in really, really hard. Exactly. Right? So right. we we have, we have our own scale. We squeeze yeah. it whichever way we need it to. So if we introduce a new type of policy that's faster or better than a previous version, we can go back and see. Okay, we released it on this date. How many people started using it, and when did they start using it? Oh. Okay. Cool. And the next question is, how do you know that the data you're getting from different systems is accurate? Great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that would be more on the art side than the science yeah. side. Yes. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll get data, traffic data. So um, we had some corrupt traffic data. So how do we figure out, okay, number one, how to fix it because we have to use it to make decisions. Um, but number two, why did that happen and how do we make it not happen again? So a lot of times, you know, it's just, there's a lot of rigor looking at the data and making sure that it looks right. Yeah. One, one, one hilarious example I thought was uh, relevant recently, when we were looking at the overall traffic on our platform, we saw a dip in the summer. It was like, oh my God, what's the problem? What's going on? And then, you know, Kumar, our analytics uh, guru says, I looked at the production or the the production traffic and it's going up steadily, so I don't know what you guys are talking about. Yeah, I was like, no, look at this graph. I was like, no, put prod beside non prod, and prod was consistently going up. And in June, the test and development traffic went down. So like, it's the testing environment. The testing. It was only the testing environment, and <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, because it's summer and a lot of business deals don't get done over the summer <laughs> yeah. and development doesn't get done over the summer so it's you know so you have to you have to gut check okay any other questions you ask science or art i've always considered them two halves of a whole do you really think of them as e either or no I mean, you, you, have, you use one to balance the other, depending I, on the day. And I think throughout, we've talked about plenty of examples where they always come in together, right? There's, yeah. there's always that gut feel, but you know what? Some of the gut feel came from the science and from the previous experience as well. I, I have to say, like, it is definitely becoming much more of a science than an art previously, right? Because previously, you really didn't have the cloud. You couldn't make any of this kind the of access to the data. The data. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but now it's just like there's no excuse to not truly understand how customers are using your product. Yeah. There's just no excuse anymore. I so. also think there's, um, sorry, Jeff, a real sense of you know this real timeness that's happening now, which is a luxury we never had before. Yeah. Consider even previously we got data. So what? You cannot put out a change there and be able to monitor the impact on whatever you're interested in right away. But today that has become widely available. So the, the real timeness has really significantly lifted our capability here to play with data science. Yeah. I think the, the science informs the art. And so let's, let's take an example of when we release a feature or product, we can see adoption, we can see what's sticking and what's not. Mm -hmm. But to introduce the next product, that's art informed by the science and by the data that we have. Yeah. But you can't just do it based on data alone. Correct. Yeah, it's vision. Very good. It's vision. Yep. You know, you have to have you have to dream big at the end of the day, yes. right? What were some of the design thoughts driving your data warehouse project? Wow, okay. So surprisingly, this started or maybe not surprisingly to some people, this started out as a complete side project. Uh, uh, in December, and we built this in a very, very short period of time. Uh, at one point, um, Anant came to me and said, how do you think we should score our customers? And I gave him an Excel sheet, and I said, okay, if they're using this, and they're using this, and they're using this, then we should give them a score, and then we throw in their traffic. He said, great, build it. What do you mean? Well, here's a Postgres database. <laughs> uh, and here's the, here's the script, the Python script that, that Kamar was using before do something and so as I as I as I started it was a very much an iterative design because I had to understand the data yeah and then understand how I wanted to store the data and index the data so in terms of a design decision and we we arrived at nucleus after nucleus is like the version two of our database or our data warehouse mm -hmm. um, data one was just store procedure calls from uh, from Python and so there was an evolution of time from 
doing uh, insert statements to doing um, score procedures and putting some of the logic to in the database to do an upsert, mm -hmm. which Postgres doesn't have. Correct. So it was it was very much an iterative thing. So going going back, it was um, again balancing the what's the interesting data mm -hmm. and what is the data what is the data that I need to uh, inform or validate my hypotheses. Um, and then also we had a different approach because this was getting data from APIs. We're not doing we're not doing ETL. We're literally getting the the resource out of URI, putting it into a database, and indexing it, aggregating them, and then deriving insights from that. So it's not your traditional data warehouse, but it's very effective. But so we're using APIs to collect API traffic to understand what API features our customers are using of our product, and we report out the data via APIs. That's right. <laughs> okay. Wow. That's it's very like cool. Re recursive here. <laughs> yes. Okay. Cool. What did you do to make the data easily accessible by your internal users? So uh, the short answer is connectors, right? We have we have a place to host uh, APIs, and we can do it in a secure manner. We have API key validation, so we have an internal developer program. So when somebody wants access to the data, mm -hmm. they can go to our developer portal and sign up as a developer. Internal developer program. So we're really using our own using our own, own product products. here again. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so. With the connectors that we built, uh, there's an introspective uh, feature, an automatic query map feature, where uh, when it starts up, it will look at the data table index uh, and then present all the tables. Correct. And then give people, you know, basically a help page that says, "Here are your restful resources. Here are the query parameters that you can get." Mm -hmm. And then that will allow them to get the data out. Also, also notice that you know, depending on the user. Like some divisions of our group are very f are just very comfortable building their own UIs, whereas other groups they need they need some help too. So for example, that 360 dashboard, uh, we dedicated some resources to provide a UI that's kind of visualize to visualize yeah. to everybody, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, but I think this is such a you know this this question is very valuable because it, it hits a very important point that we're trying to convey and share with our audience and especially our customers here, which is. If you do uh, believe in data-driven product management, excellent. But do know the power of data is about sharing it. Um, and we've seen many company or many organization where they have some insight, but they try to hold on to it you know, on their own. And that really means you have a much more significant uphill battle to try to convince the rest of your company to move towards a mission together, right? But in this case, you know, making that available, making it easier to be access to the group that you intend this to be shared with is actually a key game changer. And also one of the things that, you know, when I first joined Apogee, we talked about the app being the experience and APIs enabling that experience mm -hmm. and then being customized for that. It's like, okay, that sounds great. I haven't really experienced that, but I'll just go with it. Um, but with this approach where we have, we collect this data that is very interesting to people and we want to expose it to them, right? Yeah. We have we have multiple business units that effectively business units that want to see certain data in the way that they think it's useful for them and their teams. Correct. Yeah. So um, what we are doing is by exposing it via API, we say here's the data, and we actually have teams that are building the experience for their users and for their consumers based on that API. Yeah. So I mean, now it actually senses like totally the API. And APIs enable you to present data and present a different experience for different audiences. And I have to say now, Jeff, you must be a believer of the I'm power <laughs> of API now. <laughs> I'm a believer. I can tell from his voice. Okay, the next question is, what do you suggest a company start with if we are to adopt a data-driven approach to manage our business? That that's really... Where do you start? Let's talk about product management. Let's talk about product management because there's 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 sales, there's marketing, there's a lot of divisions. So, what do you think about product management? I, I think the key thing here is navigate and understand what data you have that's you know more at immediate access. That's that's more immediately accessible, and you can use that as a starting point. But keep in mind, you know, talking to the customers, start validating how effective are some of these data, right? How true are they telling the story? And this gives you an important starting point to try to expand. What I'm trying to counter this with a different approach is people may come in and think big. 
to say we need this 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 and all that but you know what when you don't have a business or a customer set where these data were readily accessible depends on the current life cycle of both the product you know product life cycle and the customer usage level you may be dreaming too big and therefore get very discouraged as soon as you get started you know the funny thing for me is that it's actually you have to go back to what you learned in grade school I, if you look at a lot of our decks now like the first stuff it looked it looked like a science report you know you put your hypothesis in write it with pencil you know you, you just it actually comes down to having that approach that scientific approach i think making that mind shift for product managers is actually the the the, the, the hardest thing it's it's easy at the same time as a step that people skip so I, I, that's what i find the mindset the mindset yeah, that's yeah. very valuable you can't addition okay i'm doing this i'm doing the wrong thing because for example you can't cut people off right you can't when you, when people are talking you have to give them a little bit more time to present the data uh, around their hypothesis as well. well so that's one very interesting point because you know a data nerd isn't necessarily going to be the best presenter of data to an executive team they can be coached but you need to give them time because they wouldn't be standing there saying, hey, look at this, this is important, we should look at this, unless it really was important. So, and I think, you know, one of the other things to consider from, product, from a product management standpoint is humans are emotional being or emotional beings. Uh, we make decisions, decisions based on our gut, and then we use our brain to validate what the decision we've made. So, you can have the best technology. That doesn't mean you're going to win. That doesn't mean customers are going to like your product. It's the person with the best product, not the best technology, that wins. So you have to be in touch with your customers. Uh, and the, the simplest thing to do to get started is have a structured way of collecting information from your customers about what their experience is like. Yeah. And use that to inform your product decisions. Mm -hmm. And find ways to uh, instrument your program or your product, whether it's a web page or something that allows you know, reporting of the right data in an anonymized fashion mm -hmm where customers have a choice to say, yeah, I, I, I want you to help me use your product better. Any other questions? What were some of the biggest challenges as you adopt a data-driven product management? Getting people to trust the data. Yeah, I, I would say <laughs> so too. And, and you know, the, the, the thing is that what I found is that it's so easy to attack the data and just not follow up with the discussion. Follow through is really, really tough. Because it's easy to, to, to say, oh, the data's not clean, and just move on, right? Yeah, and so I, I was told one time, I need to check your math. That can't be correct. I was like, you don't think I can do math? <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, we, and we went from having zero data to a massive amount of data very quickly. And there are two problems with that. One is, you know, people need time to catch up. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other, the other thing was we made it look easy. So they're like, oh, let's do this, 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 this. And you can do that now, right? <laughs> we need uh, more time. <laughs> but I think, you know, Jeff, what, what you brought up here is such a strong confirmation of the two points we just talked about earlier on. One is we need to share it. We need to get more people into the game so that it's not always a you know, believer, non-believer, trying to, trying to fight that battle. And secondly is really what Alan said for the mindset, right? We, we need to all have that mindset and nurture that particular mindset. It's like a culture change within, you know, a company, a group of product managers. We need to start with hopefully smaller success, but then they will lead to bigger ones. I was thinking just one like actionable because, you know, I think the people who are interested in this, you know, really want to you know, benefit from our experience here. I think the, the actionable thing is, you know, educate people where the data is coming from yeah. and how you're getting it and how often you're getting it. Because if it's, if it's the last week's data and you're making a decision based on that, they need to know. Context. Yeah. context. You've got to give them context you have around the context the for the data. Yeah. So for, you know, we have to, so, and if you have a score, how are you calculating that score? It shouldn't be a fancy answer. It's, they have a high score because X, Y, and Z. You have a low score because A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to understand that. And once you get people to that point, then you can proceed. We talked about features a few minutes ago, and I'm not sure if you have anything else to add. How do you make decisions about feature prioritization? Uh, yes, that's a, that's a great question. You know, 
the, the thing about feature usage, when you're talking about feature prioritization, it's usually a feature prioritization of either uh, an improvement to an existing feature or some drastically new type of feature, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we use data, we, the way we use data, like if, if, it's, a, if it's an incremental improvement, um, we try to prioritize the incremental improvements on the feature sets that we know are being used, right? And we can calculate all the, we can calculate those things, just mm -hmm. so, such as, um, you know, a, a good example would be uh, not, uh, not necessarily the, the connectors, but we just see in general a lot of JavaScript being written to uh, inside our, our systems, right? And so that kind of gives us an indicator at a high level. People really care about Node.js. People are really building out this, the trend of building out these mm -hmm. really small, lightweight services. That's not trend. That's not just fiction. That's real. That's real. Right? Yeah. So that we, we need to actually invest into more of these kind of future features that are in this kind of area. Right? At the same time, you know, we got to temper that with the, the big ticket items, right? Like, um, uh, you know, Internet of Things. We might not have a lot of people using Internet of Things with our current product, but that's something that's really big. So we kind of have to temper all those those things together. And also, to bring it together, we have to focus on the experience too. Because yeah. like, if we build the best OAuth server, but the experience using it is bad, then you know we need to make a decision on how we make the experience good in addition to implementing that feature. And last question. What other tools do you do you use for data driven product management? So Hello. tools, um, you know, we talked about just now some of the internal sources, right? Um, the internal capability from our Apogee Edge, um, our own analytics capabilities, our own analytics tools there. Um, I think Jeff just now talked about a whole bunch of additional, whether it's um, you know database source or scoring capabilities. You know these different tools we use. We talked about NPS, um, and that's sort of an instrument we leverage to collect additional data that's besides um, straight data points, right? We get get to have a combination of both qualitative and quantitative here. Uh, we also use visualization tools um, to be able to Tableau. help us, yeah, such as Tableau to help us navigate our our dashboard and be able to drill the next level of insight. So um, clearly, you know, as I've earlier on mentioned in the summary, be prepared to develop your own tool bag and know you you're gonna keep you know acquire new tools there. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty passionate about this because I believe that there's two classes of tools. Tools are very specialized for a task and then tools that join and connect the dots. Uh, tools are specialized for tasks, Google Analytics, Tableau, um, you know, other survey software out there, but it's the bringing everything together and connecting the dots that dri drives huge value. And in fact, that, I think that's one of our, the, the, the data warehouse that we built. It is huge value because we are connecting the dots. We're, we're driving insights from it. Absolutely. Okay, so we're out of time, uh, but before then, I just want to remind you about the conference. And as you can see on the top, there's the uh, coupon code. So the first 10 people sign up, we'll get it $195. And guess what? We'll all be there, and we really want to talk to you. Uh, we would love to talk to you about what's going on in your company. Um, we, can tell, we can show you a little bit more about how we built our data warehouse. Absolutely. The technologies that Apogee, if you're, if you're a customer of Apogee, uh, we can show you what kind of technologies that you can already use. You have it already. That yep. you already have for. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> for that this you entire have time. For this entire time. Just hope to see you there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.